Folks, if you're just joining us, we're speaking with Alex Trayman. We're talking about a new documentary video that's just been released. And it's good timing because of all the unrest that's been going on uh, in the Middle East. The documentary is called Iranium. And we're going to be looking at the realities of Iran and also the realities of Iran obtaining nuclear weapons. Now, despite what the Iranian regime is telling the world, this documentary documents the fact that they are indeed trying to obtain nuclear weapons and most importantly the delivery systems for that and that means Israel is in peril and the rest of the world by extension. Alex I want to welcome, to, welcome you to the show thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thanks so much for having me. What got you started? Um, you know a young man like yourself what was it about Iran and the whole nuclear proliferation issue that got you intrigued enough to do a documentary on it? Well, I'd spent a lot of time as a journalist in the Middle East, and so obviously I'd heard a lot about the Iranian nuclear threat. Uh, but I went to a few conferences with some Israeli personnel, uh, military and defense experts and that sort. And after spending time at that conference for three days, I recognized that there was a lot more about Iran that I didn't know. So I started reading, and I read The Rise of Nuclear Iran uh, by Dory Gold, and I read The Persian Night by a uh, famous Iranian uh, dissident journalist, Amir Tahari. And when I got through those books, I understood that there was a deep ideology that was underwriting Iran's nuclear program, and that uh, ideology had been carried out with brutal acts of terror and brutality against Iran's own citizens for 30 years. And I thought that uh, I had learned so much, and I was certain that most Americans, Canadians, Westerners didn't understand the threat. So we sought out to make this film. Okay, the threat is real without question. And I know this because I am very close to the Persian community here in Canada. Um, I, as a matter of fact, folks, if you go to the www.brenthollandshow.com, you're going to find a whole uh, library worth of interviews that I've done. Um, Reza Khalili is there. He's a Persian... Um, CIA person that was uh, involved with the Revolutionary Guards. He's also part of your documentary. Uh, Marina Nemed is there, folks, a uh, Persian-Canadian who was uh, captured and tortured in Evan Prison. As I say, there's a whole litany of, of people there. Let's go back to Reza Khalili now. I bring up his name purposely because he's been on this show, and what he brought to the table with his book, A Time to Betray, was absolutely astounding. Now, he's in your documentary. What does he bring to the table for your documentary? Well, we thought it was very important to have Iranians in the film, and particularly those that had a sort of inside track into the minds of uh, the Revolutionary Guards, and he was a member of Iran's Revolutionary Guards, acting as an agent for the CIA during the 80s and 90s, but he's not the only uh, Revolutionary Guards member that was in the film. Uh, Mohsen Sazagara uh, was one of the founders of the Revolutionary Guards and was a spokesperson to Ayatollah Khomeini in the early days following the revolution. And so it was very important for us to get uh, some of the insiders that really could tell uh, from their own perspective, exactly what guides uh, the Iranian Revolution, their Guard Corps, and their leaders. Folks, we're speaking with Alex Trayman this afternoon. His uh, documentary is called Iranium, and the links for that, for you able to purchase the documentary, will be on the www.brenthollandshow.com website. Just click on the link that's there right beside Alex's picture and his name. That'll take you right to a place where you can get it from the comfort of your own home. Educate yourself on this one, folks, because the world is in jeopardy now. The naysayers, Alex, I hear them all now. Well, so what? Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel has nuclear weapons, the whole world has nuclear weapons, why not Iran too? Well, you know, there's, there's a few reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, there's no, the leaders of Pakistan are not uh, outright calling for the destruction of Israel or for the United States, as uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad has stated publicly in his speeches uh, inside Tehran. Uh, at the same time, uh, Iran is one of the signatories to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which means that any sort of activities which lead towards nuclear weapons are completely and totally illegal. 
according to international law. And with regards to Israel, I mean, it's one of the world's worst kept se secrets that Israel has nuclear weapons. But I'll tell you, the Saudis or the Egyptians are not going to sleep at night worried that Israel is going to attack them tomorrow with nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't know if we can say the same about uh, our situation with Iran. You know, Israel, Israel's very, and you're calling from Israel right now, by the way, folks. He's live on, on Skype if you're watching uh, online or if you're listening on the radio across Canada. Uh, Israel's a very small country. Uh, Ahmadinejad has already said that he would welcome an exchange of nuclear weapons, a nuclear exchange with Israel because, quote unquote, Iran is bigger and can absorb more hits than Israel. And the ultimate goal, of course, would be to wipe Israel off the map. That's very scary rhetoric. Yeah, and he's not the first person to say that. Uh, really, the quote-unquote father of Iran's nuclear program, uh, former president, Hashemi Rafsanjani, was asked in 2001 a similar question. Could he envision a nuclear war between Iran and between Israel? And he said, of course I could see that. I said, if Iran was struck with nuclear weapons, he said, we would continue to survive. If Israel was hit by a singular nuclear weapon, it would be wiped off the map. So, you know, it, it really affects the, the way that we have to deal with Iran because their calculus in terms of the loss of human life is not the same as we have in the West. Alex, when you undertook this project, I'm sure you had preconceived uh, notions of what was going on behind the scenes in Iran. What were some of the things that you weren't aware of that are brought out in the documentary? What are the things that really scared you to death? Well, I think that there was this sort of uh, messianic, apocalyptic nature of the regime. I wasn't uh, fully aware of that. Uh, you know, it, uh, the Quranic literature talks about um, the coming of the 12th Imam, the Mahdi, uh, the descendants of uh, Muhammad, uh, that's supposed to come. And, and really, it, it says that when he comes, the two-thirds of the world are going to be wiped out, one-third by the sword and one-third by plague. And there's a lot of people inside Iran today, uh, well, not a lot, but uh, rather within Iran's leadership that actually believe that they can bring about the return of the Mahdi by creating those conditions. So while there's other uh, Shiites in Iran that believe that the Mahdi or the, the, the Messianic figure comes when he comes, uh, inside Iran's leadership, they actually believe that they can bring it back by setting those dangerous preconditions on Earth by creating apocalyptic scenarios. Folks, we're speaking with Alex Trayman right now. He's director of a brand new documentary, an alarming documentary called Iranium, www.brenthollandshow.com. As always, click on the link. That'll take you right to a place where you can get this video from the comfort of your own home. Get the video. Get educated. This is a real threat. Now, we talked about the threat to Israel, and I set off at the, uh, um, at the beginning of the show that by extension it is a threat to the world. Why is Iran more of a threat to the rest of the world than say a Pakistan where there's not a lot of stability there either? Well, really the, Iran has a 30-year history of trying to export their Islamic revolution across the world. You know, we don't have this long record of attacks by that have been underwritten by the Pakistani government against American installations across the world. With Iran, that's not the case. Iran is the sponsor of terror organizations, sponsor and organizer of organizations such as Hezbollah. Uh, they are financing Hamas. They have uh, collaborated together with Al Qaeda and pretty much every other Islamic terrorist organization in the world. So they really have a history of using whatever tools were at their disposal to attack. American and Western interests. So I think that it's the history of Iran and their regime and their actions that really puts a scare into us. Also, uh, people don't realize that it's really the United States, even more so than Israel, that has been targeted as enemy number one of the Iranian regime. The Iranian constitution uh, clearly calls for the export of revolutionary ideals across the world and even references Imam Khomeini's plot against the American conspiracy. The Iranian constitution calls for the establishment of a universal holy government and the downfall of all others. So I think it's when you look inside the constitution, you look at the actions for 30 years, uh, this makes the threat of a nuclear Iran very real. You've, Alex, you've also got some real heavy hitters um, in the, the documentary. People, as you mentioned before, uh, Dory Gold's in it, uh, John Bolton. What were some of the revelations that they brought to the table? 
Well, I think the the most uh, stunning revolution was uh, revelation rather was just how uh, brutally we have misread the situation from the beginning of the uh, revolution in 1979. You know, we called Khomeini uh, some kind of saint when he came back to Tehran. We thought that he was somebody that we could work with, that he was some sort of a moderate, that he was committed to democracy. And that was a painful mistake and a mistake that we shouldn't have made because Khomeini had written uh, some pretty, ex published some pretty extreme writings uh, while he was in the suburbs of Paris before the revolution. Uh, and that we have similarly misread the situation and really played our cards completely wrong for the past 30 years. Every American president, every Western leader from Jimmy Carter on forward has made critical mistakes that have put us in this situation. And I think the most shocking thing is that we're not learning from our mistakes. And that in the United States, uh, President Obama is making the exact same mistakes that his predecessors had made before him. You know, the similarities to what took place in 1979, the Iranian Revolution I'm talking about right now, folks, and what has just taken place in Egypt these past few weeks are alarming. The first thing I said to people around me when all this started was, I am afraid the Muslim Brotherhood is going to get into power in Egypt. And, you know, I don't want to be prophetic, but they have now come out and said that they will probably run in a future uh, run run uh, for power in a future election, and this scares the the hell out of me. Um, do you smell Iran behind the scenes in any of this? Well, I don't think Iran is actually behind the scenes in this because uh, I think that uh, from what I've heard that the Iranian regime is extraordinarily scared by what's going on uh, inside Egypt today. Uh, they see the people coming out into the streets, and not only coming out into the streets, but with the ability to overthrow their their government. Uh, and this was the second such uh, second such uh, revolution that took place in a matter of weeks. You know, just remember the same thing happened in Tunisia uh, just a few weeks back. And the Iranians are deathly afraid that uh, the Iranian people will come out onto the streets, uh, as they did in June 2009, by the way. Uh, but this time, with a little bit more force and a little bit more impetus to stay on the streets, even if they're attacked by you know, the besieged and other shock troops that the Iranian regime might set out there. Uh, to sort of squash their protests, but uh, if the Iranian people feel that they have the opportunity to overthrow that regime, uh, well, they've been waiting for that opportunity for many years. So the Iranians are very, very afraid uh, by what's been going on in Egypt today. Folks, we're talking about an alarming new documentary that is going to send all kinds of alarms off. I'm going to come back to that word and I guess I'm going to beat it to death, but that's what this documentary does. It brings to the forefront the fact that Iran, without question, is trying to get offensive nuclear weapons and the chances of them using it are better than average. Um, we're talking about Alex Trayman today. With Alex Trayman today, he's the director of the documentary, and we're examining some of the things that are taking place around the world, not only in Egypt but uh, in other Middle East countries as well. Uh, the uprising that seems to be taking place, and also we're looking at Iran specifically inside the Iranian regime, and that's where I'd like to go now. Are there voices of moderation? in the Iranian regime. And, and somebody, you know, I interviewed Ted Sorensen, JFK speechwriter, and he said there's always somebody, he was talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's always somebody in power somewhere that you can reach out to. Do you feel that there may be somebody in place in Iran that perhaps a normal dialogue without all the, the crazy overtones of the religious aspects. Is there somebody there that, that can be reached out to? Inside the government, I highly doubt it. Uh, mm. Really, the Iranian regime has set up this uh, sort of fictitious government uh, that is sort of hand-picked. I mean, the Supreme Leader has this uh, guardian council. They have this council of elders. Mm -hmm. And they literally hand-pick who can run in each election. That's right. Uh, you know, so they, they have made sure that they've stacked the entire parliament and, and all the executive branch of their government and also the judicial system, uh, which is completely infiltrated by the Revolutionary Guards, with loyalists. Um, so to say that there's a moderate inside the government, uh, I highly doubt it, not to mention if there was a moderate uh, that was found out inside the 
the Iranian government, believe me, he would be sent to Evan prison, he would be tortured and probably executed. Uh, so it's unlikely that uh, you will find a moderate to work with inside the Iranian government. Mm. That's uh, very disturbing, actually. How is the reaction outside of Iran to your documentary? I'm thinking of folks like Shirini Badzi, who's a folks uh, Nobel Peace Laureate from 2003. Her interview, by the way, folks, is on the www.brenthollandshow.com website as well. Um, how has the reaction been uh, with folks like that in, in people that have been exiled, primarily living in Los Angeles and perhaps Toronto here in Canada? Right. Uh, well, I, I didn't speak with the, the person you referenced, but uh, we have had con uh, significant contacts with uh, many Iranian dissidents. And uh, by and large, the reaction has been very supportive of the film, although there are those in the Iranian community and dissident community that don't want to see the possibility of uh, any sort of military intervention inside Iran, and, and obviously you can understand why. Uh, but the Iranian community does not disagree at all with the dangers that are posed by Iran's nuclear threat, and they do not disagree uh, with the brutality that we have documented in the film against Iran's own citizens, and also the history of terror you know, around the world. So I, I think that uh, Iranians are very encouraged to actually see that there's a documentary out there uh, that supports their cause, and, and I've met many Iranians during the filming of the, of the documentary and also after we finished production. I can tell you that the Iranian people uh, are very, very... Uh, proud of their long culture. These are not Arabs. These, they're Persians, and they have a, right. a, a, a tremendous culture, uh, which they are very proud of. Uh, they are very sophisticated people. They are polite, extraordinarily polite. They are fashionable. They are tech-savvy. They are modern. Uh, they are progressive. They really, truly believe in a separation of church and state, uh, which uh, obviously their leaders do not. And they are very, very hopeful that they can take their country back from the Ayatollahs. And let's not forget, folks, we're talking about the Persian Empire, and that's Cyrus. And Cyrus was responsible for the first declaration of human rights. Now, I want to qualify that. We're talking 6,000 years ago. But he was the first person to pay slaves, allow people to uh, worship their own gods, speak in their own languages. 6,000 years ago. It had never been done before. That scroll, by the way, folks, is in the foyer of the United Nations. Actually, I think right now it could be back in Iran, which scares me as well. Alex, I want to talk some more about, I want to go in two specific directions in the next little while. The first one I want to go with is Canada, but after that I want to talk about Hamas and Hezbollah and the amount of funding that comes from Iran. By the way, folks, if you're just joining us, we're speaking with Alex Trayman. He's got an astounding new video out, an alarming one as well. It warns of a nuclear Iran. The um, video is called, the documentary is called Iranium. Easy way to get it, www.brenthollandshow.com. Click on the link. It will take you right to a place where you can get it from the comfort of your own home without even leaving as uh, I look outside today. Uh, it's snowing here in Canada. Alex is in Israel. He's joining us. Let's go to Ottawa. Now, there was a lot of hoopla surrounding the first screening of this video in Ottawa in Canada, right here in Canada. Can you tell us that story? Sure. You know, the, actually the very first public screening of the film was to take place in Ottawa, and that happened uh, kind of coincidentally. Uh, the film was supposed to be screened on January 18th, uh, by the Free Thinking Film Society, uh, and they normally hold uh, many of their documentary films, which they show about once a month, in the National Archives, the National Library and Archives of Canada, uh, which uh, I'm sure that your listeners recognize is right across the street from Canadian Parliament and the Supreme Court. Um, now, the Iranian embassy actually called up the government and uh, sort of demanded that they wouldn't hold the screening. And the National Archives actually buckled to the request, and they, they went ahead and they canceled the screening. Now, the organizer of that screening, Fred Litwin of the Free Thinking Film Society, uh, he was extremely dismayed, and he took the effort to reach out to the Heritage Minister James Moore. He contacted him by phone, by email, even by Facebook, and somehow or another he got through. And Minister Moore insisted that the National Archives would, in fact, show the screening as scheduled on the 18th. Uh, and uh, Fred Litwin was actually going to the screening that day and had already purchased the, the food for the event, uh, was planning on having the screening, 
uh, when threats of protests, and some said that there even were some protesters inside the building, and also apparently someone came to the National Archives uh, with two suspicious letters uh, that reportedly contained white powder in them, and the, the person that delivered them was apparently shouting Arabic into his telephone uh, when he dropped them off, and that was enough for the Royal uh, Mounted Police to uh, shut the building down and effectively cancel the screening. Now, Heritage Minister Moore was contacted again, and uh, he did not uh, respond favorably to the cancellation of the screening. He stated very publicly that Canada would not be dictated to or bullied by the regime in Tehran, and that Canada would not be told which movies could or could not be shown uh, in a national, in a federal building in Ottawa. Uh, and um, he ac absolutely saw this as an opportunity to defend uh, freedom of speech in Canada, and the uh, the film was screened, in fact, on February 6th, this past Sunday, uh, to a packed house at the National Archives and Library in Ottawa. Muzzle tough. That's wonderful news. Um, I want to ask you, what happened with that white powder? That's the first I've heard of that. I didn't realize that part of the story. Yeah, actually, Fred Whitwin has, uh, I forget exactly how they call it, but he's uh, trying to order some kind of... Uh, inquiry of information or, or however they, they call it legally in Canada to find out exactly uh, what happened. Uh, it's still a little bit of an unknown to, to what extent uh, those that tried to block the screening uh, actually uh, carried out their activities. You know, here in Canada, we have something called Israel Apartheid Week that's just around the corner from us now, too. And there's another week that scares the bejesus out of me, too, when um, freedom of speech is really stepped on big time here, when anybody with an opposition voice to the uh, Palestinian movement um, gets shut out. And that's happened to me personally. By the way, folks, I, I spoke out in opposition to... Um, what I consider the uh, misinformed, to put it mildly, the lies that are spewed forth about Israel, and I was shut down big time, twice, two years in a row. Let's talk about Hamas and Hezbollah. Let's start off with Hamas. Folks, if you're not sure, you, you know, many people listening right now know Hamas and Hezbollah are terrorist organizations, and they, they hate Jews, they hate Israel, but they don't know where they are. Hezbollah is in the north, uh, they're in Lebanon, and um, they are financed, oddly enough, by the Iranian regime, and Hamas is in the Gaza Strip. Now, um, the Gaza Strip is on the western side of Israel, and it's just a little strip, hence the word Gaza Strip. Let's go to Hamas first and talk about them, shall we, in the Gaza Strip. Now, they're funded completely, or just about completely, by, oddly enough, as I say, Iran. And I say that because there's that whole Shia Sunni thing happening, and um, Hamas is primarily uh, Sunni uh, Muslims, and usually they don't get along. But in this case, I guess money talks. Yeah, you know, it, it might have been appropriate to start first with Hezbollah. Which okay, was, go ahead, go ahead. Which was actually founded. Uh, by directly by the regime in Iran uh, in the early 80s. And they fund, as you mentioned, uh, they're completely funding uh, Hezbollah. That's their cutout. That's their proxy that they established. And through the success of that organization to inflict terror on American installations around the world, and Hezbollah is, is one of the most sophisticated uh, te terrorist organizations in the world, possibly more dangerous even than Al-Qaeda. And they have certainly uh, carried out some of the largest attacks, uh, terrorist attacks that we've ever seen in the world, you know, such as the ones in Beirut uh, in 1983, those two attacks there, which were responsible for the deaths uh, combined of, of close to 400 um, individuals, and, and then throughout, uh, throughout the 80s and 90s as well. Uh, and they also have uh, sleeper cells already within the United States, certainly sleeper cells in Mexico, and some believe even up into Canada. Uh, with regard to Hamas, as you mentioned, there is this sort of uh, Sunni-Shiite divide, uh, with Hamas being a Sunni organization, actually with its roots in Egypt's Muslim Brotherhood. Bingo. Uh, and, uh, but these groups, even though they, they have uh, significant... Uh, beefs with one another uh, between Shiites and Sunnis when it comes to uniting against a common enemy 
Uh, they seem to do that quite well. And I'm, I wouldn't say that Iran uh, solely funds Hamas, but they are a primary contributor uh, to their terrorist activities and are, have been responsible for uh, the delivery of long-range missiles to both Hezbollah and to Hamas. Exactly. Now, the reason why I mention this is because, God forbid, Iran should ever get nuclear weapons um, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to, to join the dots where they would give some of those uh, weapons, even small little suitcase nukes, to either Hezbollah or Hamas, and we know for sure that they would use them. I mean, Hamas would just lob them right over, uh, right into Israel proper, and uh, that would be it. I mean, thousands would die just from the fallout. Well, we don't know for certain that they would use the nuclear weapons. However, based on their 30-year history, we really don't have any indication that they wouldn't use them. And uh, I think one of the other dangerous scenarios that, uh, these, that people should understand, because I'm certain that there are people listening to this program or, or to other programs that say, well, they're not actually going to do it. Well, we talked about the, the sort of uh, human life calculation that uh, we carry in the West. The Iranian regime certainly does not carry uh, with regard to uh, mutual assured destruction or retaliation that, that might occur. But think even about a scenario uh, similar to September 11th where a rather conventional attack was used to inflict terror on the United States or it could be against Canada, against Israel, against Europe, wherever it is, even just a conventional terror attack, if Iran is protecting Hezbollah and Hamas with this sort of nuclear umbrella, can you imagine the United States or whatever country was attacked carrying out a counter-strike? Uh, that nuclear umbrella sort of protects uh, these terrorist organizations to operate almost freely without any consequences against them. Precisely. And, um, you know, it's a very, very scary scenario, much more so than um, I agree with you than Pakistan is right now. I think uh, this is the new Cold War, if you will. Um, I, I think it's very scary indeed. Well, this Brent, but Brent it's, not, it's not a Cold War uh, because Iran is actively killing Americans and Israelis, you know, every day, and they've been doing that for the past 30 years. It's just that we are, uh, uh, we're not reacting, you know. <laughs> Iran is responsible for the majority of insurgencies against uh, coalition forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, weapons that are killing uh, American troops there, you know, have Iranian markings on them. You know, the training to Taliban fighters against the uh, coalition forces in Afghanistan is occurring inside Iran. So I don't think that this is a Cold War at all. I think that the Iranians are at active war with the United States, and we have yet to acknowledge that. Why do you think that is? Why don't we acknowledge it and uh, react to it? Well, I think that uh, we don't want to. I mean, we, the United States is at war, as I mentioned, in Iraq and in Afghanistan, and uh, public opinion about those two wars is uh, pretty unfavorable. And I think that the American people, and particularly the leadership, they don't want to engage, you know, another enemy. And because they don't want one, they choose to deny it. Uh, maybe they think that uh, Iran just wouldn't strike. I mean, there's been no country that's used nuclear weapons since the United States did, you know, at the end of World War II. And I, perhaps they believe that, you know, Iran just wants those weapons to sort of achieve a status, you know, as a nuclear power, uh, but wouldn't actually use them. And, and so I think that we've created a paralysis. You know, Iran has been in the news already for so many years uh, that we have this sort of slow boil effect whereby the situation gets hotter and hotter uh, but we don't feel it. Do you think Israel will go in and take out the nuclear facilities? Well I don't think that they want to do that uh, but I think that if it was a life or death situation if they felt that they were in the final moments uh, I definitely believe that they would do whatever was in their power uh, militarily or otherwise in order to take out Iran's nuclear program and I'm very encouraged that they are looking for other ways of dealing with Iran's nuclear problem, including cyber warfare. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a genuine threat, and I don't think it's a threat that uh, Israel can afford to take uh, lightly at all in any respects. So, and they're not taking it lightly. They're, they're taking it very seriously. If only the rest of the world would take it as seriously as the Israelis are. Exactly. We're going to have to start to wrap up now, but I want to thank you both for making the uh, the time this evening, because I know it's evening in Israel right now, and also making the movie. I, I think it's uh, fabulous that you've done something like this to initiate dialogue at the very least and alertness here in it, North America. 
Exactly, you know, and that's the point of a documentary film. It's to raise a debate. You know, I invite anybody to watch it, and then I invite people to challenge uh, what they see. You know, at, at least let's start talking about it because we're not going to get uh, from the point of view in public opinion where we are today of not wanting Iran to cross the nuclear threshold to the point where we need to be, which is saying that it's completely unacceptable. Uh, for Iran to cross the nuclear threshold unless we advance the debate. And I hope that this documentary will do that, and I hope that people will watch the film, uh, buy DVDs, organize screenings in uh, churches, synagogues, community centers, college campuses, uh, in any place where we can get more people to watch and we can start talking a little bit more fervently about what I think is one of the most dangerous threats we face. Agreed. Shalom, my friend, and thank you. Thank you so much, Prince.